My name is Julie Pearson Littlefender. Today is December 13th, 2013, and I'm in Wagner, Oklahoma, talking with Cherokee artist Ron Mitchell. Ron, you've been in the native art business for more than 42 years, and you've won over 300 awards at numerous native art shows in and out of state. You're known for your creative approaches in matting and presenting artwork as well. You always have a beautiful professional booth set up. And you recently moved to Wagner from Prague. Thank you for taking the time to speak with me today. It was my pleasure. Where were you born and where did you grow up? I was born in Fort Benning, Georgia, when my dad was in the Army. We, he was stationed there after uh, being up in the Aleutian Islands during the uh, early outbreak of the war. And I grew up at different Army bases around the world uh, until I was in the eighth grade. Every year I was at a different school. And, uh, some one year, three years I was in Germany for a while. Oh my goodness. Um, what did your, you mentioned that your dad was in the army, how about your mom? Mom was a housewife, she pretty much stayed around the house and my dad kind of, always kind of related to dad running it like continuing part of the army. He was the first sergeant, <laughs> mom was the corporal, and me and my brother were the privates. <laughs> so, so one sibling, is he older or younger? He's younger. Yeah, I was an only child for six years, and he came along and messed it up. <laughs> Is your Cherokee on your mom or your dad's side? My dad's side. Did you have much contact with your grandparents on either side? Actually, both grandparents on both sides. Um, when we were stateside, particularly before my brother was born, uh, when we were st uh, dad was stationed at Fort Sill, I spent a lot of the summers in Tulsa and Locust Grove. My mother's mother lived in Tulsa. My dad's mother, the Cherokee, she lived in Locust Grove. So they'd stick me on a bus and send me back and forth. I remember, you know, four or five years old riding the bus back and forth by myself. Do that today. <laughs> I bet that was a great adventure. Uh, were you around the language then a little bit and culture growing up? Or? Grandma spoke Cherokee. She is a she was not a traditionalist. A lot of her friends were. She was a Baptist. And we had an interesting history about the language. I didn't know it when I was younger. I know now. But growing up, all my cousins on my Cherokee side of the family are girls. And Grandma would, every when we would all stay up there at her house at Locust uh, during the summer, after breakfast every day, she'd make the girls stay in and teach them Cherokee. I was allowed to go outside and play. I never thought anything about it. I just thought I was a privileged character being the only male child. But later, reviewing history and looking at uh, some of our family records, I ran across a letter from Anthony Foreman. He married Susan Gordfields. He was, uh, this was in the 1700s, so he's that's seven generations back. And in this letter, he wrote that I want all the male children to dress and speak English because they were going to have to carry on business in a white man's world. And he wanted all the girls to speak and dress Cherokee to carry on the Cherokee tradition. The irony of the thing is that I'm the only one to carry on the Cherokee tradition today, and I still don't speak the language. I couldn't even ask for cornbread if I was starving. <laughs> Wow, and this is the Foreman family that yes, you come from. Yes, Did you have any f other family members who were artists? Not on our Cherokee side of the family. Uh, we, on the my mother's side of the family, the Hensleys, there were some very talented people. My cousin, who's a, a year younger than me, she's a well-known wood carver out in the uh, northwest of the United States in Oregon. What is your first memory of seeing Native art? Oh, I guess probably when I first started doing art shows, because growing up, I just don't recall being around. Well, wait a minute. There was a time, I remember we went to uh, uh, Spiral Mounds and I, as a little boy, and I remember that was probably the first time that I was around anything that was of Native American. Of course, growing up, you know, in Locust Grove in the summer, and then Dad being in the Army down at Lawton, I was uh, around a lot of the Kiowa and the Comanche style of work in high school. What is your first memory of making art? The first memory of making art was 
was actually an experience in the second grade that probably would have discouraged most people from ever being an artist. Teachers today, I hope, are considerably more understanding. But at the time, well, I am red-green colorblind. Very seriously red-green colorblind. In the second grade, I had no idea I was colorblind. Uh, I just thought I was a little slow in figuring out colors. And I remember we did this Crayola drawing, and it was supposed to be a tree. And of course, I the, was the only one in the class that actually had roots on the tree, branches on the tree. But she held the picture up in front of the class and she tried to humiliate me because of the colors I used mm -hmm. in it. She said, look at this picture. Can you believe this? He has a purple sky, a green tree trunk, and brown grass. And I don't know, it just didn't, maybe it made me mad. You know, it's like, I'll show you. And I hope I did show her. <laughs> so that was uh, undoubtedly an uh, experience in elementary school that was formative. How about art experiences in middle school or high school? Well, the first award I won was actually in Germany in the uh, fourth grade. I won a poster contest. And then the next time I really had any... that I really noticed that I was probably better than most of the other kids in the class was in seventh grade in Fort Smith, Arkansas. We had a they had a tri-semester where the school year was divided up into three and one of those semesters was an art and at that class I was if not the best artist at least one of the best artists in there and but the next award I actually won was um, the ninth grade in Lawton, Oklahoma I won first place in watercolor at uh, a, a national uh, and a, a local show that they had there and then in high school I really lucked out. I had an outstanding art teacher, Velma Bailey. She was, she took about three or about five of us that were above average artists and really kind of gave us separate education from the rest of the kids in the class. We entered competitions in all over the uh, Oklahoma and Texas. In our class, we won numerous awards. Um, my junior and senior year in high school, I won first place in architectural design and graphics. Uh, the, gra the architectural design was through uh, Central State College, I believe it's called something. They're in Edmond, Oklahoma. I think it's a full university now. But, and, but I remember we, I mean, it got to the point that some of the other schools weren't inviting us to come to the, our class was just really doing well. And we had a uh, art club there that was called the Palette and Brush Club. And I was the, uh, my senior year, I was the vice president of, the, of that organization. Wow. And that was the first time I actually entered a, uh, a non-school competition. Uh, Cash Road Square in Lawton had a, a spring art festival that year, and they had a student section. And I actually entered, and I won first place in the, in the drawing competition that year at, the, at their, uh, in the open mall. <laughs> That's wonderful. Did you, were you already thinking of yourself as an artist? No, my family really didn't know what to do with me. <laughs> I was not a good student. Um, my mind was always off on art and uh, the few teachers that figured that out was able to use the art to, for me to, uh, proceed in their classes at a, at a passing level. Um, Mom was just, and Dad, they, neither one of them really could think of anything to do with art. Um, they were trying to push me into a, an engineering or a, a, an architectural thing, and I actually ended up working for a, an architectural and structural engineer my junior year in high school. After winning that first place, I actually got a job offer. It was Basically, you know, the office flunky, you cleaned up, but you're around it. That was a great benefit for me because it introduced me to quality materials. Up until that point of time, arts in high school level, 
you didn't have good quality materials. I mean, you're working with cheap watercolor brushes, tempera, uh, uh, newsprint, you know, stuff. That, and when I got around these architectural and they were doing the presentations and they were using commercial products, airbrushing, um, illustration board, the technical drawing pens, and all of this work, I went, it all, it's reflection and work I do today is what I learned and being around and actually doing some of that early technical drawing and drafting work. I'm sort of surprised in a way that um, your folks weren't more open to the idea of art just because of maybe that European exposure as well, being in Germany. Do you think that impacted you at all? Well, I'm not sure that that impacted me, but it was the military that did. Because this was after World War II, 1953, 1954, 1955 in Germany. I mean, it had been, what, six years after the war had ended. Um, most enlisted men, which is, my dad was a, a sergeant, most of our friends were military, were sergeants, going into their homes. And even today, I think one of the biggest impacts that is even reflected in my work today was early exposure to Oriental work. Even though we weren't in the Orient, these other enlisted people were, and they had, I remember fascinated by some of these uh, screen prints and block prints from the, uh, from Japanese like Mount Fuji and stuff. And if you really look at that work, it's a trail of tears. It's Cherokee flats, I mean, it's our traditional flat style. There is so parallel to it. So when I started doing the native work, I immediately drew back on the oriental work. And uh, I, I think it shows in my work a lot of times. Uh, I particularly like, I use a lot of a, what I call a woodblock style trees in my background. And it's a stylized trees that's influenced from that 1954-55 early influence of this oriental work. Thanks for sharing that. Um, so what did you do after high school? What was your path? I was trying to follow my parents' wish to go into the technical or drafting uh, engineering. I went to Cameron for a year. Uh, that Cameron just didn't, Junior College. Yeah, it was Latin. a junior college at the time. Um, that just didn't really work out. I decided to go in the Air Force. Uh, had the highest entrance exam score they'd ever had out of Oklahoma City. Guaranteed any school I wanted to. Got down to Lackland and they went, you're colorblind. You can't go to any of those schools. What do you want to be, a cook or an air policeman? Mm -hmm. I said, give me a rifle. <laughs> and once I got out of there, out of the service, I went down to Dallas and uh, end up working as a tech illustrator. I didn't even know what a tech illustrator was at the time, but there was a um, manpower job shop, we call it job shopping back then, it was a contract type labor where you actually weren't working directly for the company, but you were doing uh, work for the company. And I got into the uh, aerospace technical illustrations and it combined that drafting and technical background with this creativity that I've always had and it, it really gave me my first time to express myself. I know there were times that we weren't allowed to get copies of what we had because it was all secret work for the government, which was disappointing because there were some really interesting things I did. One of the more interesting pieces was uh, a spy scout, t t uh, spy telescope for a satellite that was uh, 42 inches wide, the drawing was, and it was seven feet long. <laughs> My goodness. I remember got real mad though after I did it all the layout. I took a day off and came back and there was another illustrator ink in it. And that's just, that's just, the artist in me really came out because I blew up. <laughs> Because of the colorblind deal, or just no, the fact that somebody else was inking my work. Mm. Yeah. But the colorblindness really didn't apparently affect me at that time because it was all black and white right. that we were dealing with. Um, 
and it was years later before I ever even tried to even do any color work. Um, would, while you were working, were you also doing some art on the side on your own time? Not at that time. Um, when did you start? It was that time we were working like 78 hours a week. So, so it was just, you know, you go home, go to sleep, you go back, go to work. Uh, it actually, the fine art end of it actually resulted because of the aerospace downturn. I was working out in L.A. and uh, that was when uh, Rolls Royce went bankrupt, the C511 plant, I mean a lot of the aircraft, the in, whole industry almost collapsed. So I came back to Oklahoma, ended up getting a job for the Oklahoma City Planning Department, the head of their graphics art section. and. That was, uh, I had 13 people working for me and I had a lot of free time because I was spending more time supervising than I was actually doing any work and that was the first time I actually remember having a close-up view of an art show. I looked out the window one spring and that first spring there in 1970 and they were setting up the Festival of the Arts and I looked out the window and I went, and I asked them, I said, what's going on down there? And they said, well, that's an art show. And I said, well, I can do that. <laughs> of course, as an artist, I hate hearing people coming to the booth and say, well, I can do that. Well, yeah, they can do it. But let them think of the idea to do it. But anyway, I went down and walked through the art show, and I was convinced I could do it. And I started doing, I did my first art show later that spring at, out at Shepherd Mall. No, it was, uh, yes, it was Shepherd Mall before. No, it was Penn Square Mall. Excuse me, Penn Square Mall. But that was a, it was an open mall then, and I shared a booth with uh, two other artists that were that worked for me at, in there, and I dragged them out there. They they came kicking and screaming, and uh, that was my first introduction. And, and so uh, your subject matter was not at the name. time I was doing pen and ink drawings. I actually started out doing Victorian houses. It was just a, something that. Fascinated. I think it goes back to the architectural background, the technical drawing background. And the first year or so, and but I've always had a little twisted sense of humor. I was also doing some a little acrylic paintings and stuff. And I remember that year uh, I did a, an acrylic. I was started out doing a painting of World War One. I. I wanted to do it, a Baron von Richthofen of uh, the Red Baron. I had the two planes. In the sky, I had his Walker DR1 triplane. I had the Spad coming in over the top of him, and down below, I had the Australian troops sitting there shooting up in the air at him. And I, I had everybody painted, but the uh, the Australian pilot uh, that was in the Spad. And I sat there and started shaking my head. And I said, "Don't do it." I did it. I put Snoopy in it. <laughs> And that was, people loved things like that when I started doing my little off humor. That was my first face at it. <clears throat> when, did, uh, when did you make the switch to full time? You were already married, I take it. Right, I was married. Son. We had two children. Um, I was working, still working for the city and uh, the Oklahoma City Planning Department. And I started that next year, I ended up doing 25 shows that next year, working full time. We'd take off, get off Friday evening, we'd do shows like in Austin, Texas, we'd drive all night, get down there, I mean two or three in the morning, get up, set up, tear down Sunday night and drive back and go to work. Now and, when you say we, was this your uh, family? My wife or would go with me, or um, I, I tried to, we always, it seemed like it was always a group of us traveling together, me and a couple other artists. It, it was always nice to share rooms and share experiences of driving and, you know, and things. We usually ended up taking vehicles, but, you know, at 35, 40 cents a gallon, it wasn't that hard to drive a pickup that only got 10 miles to the gallon. And unfortunately, I was young, unfortunately, I was young to be able to handle that. Unfortunately, I had a lead foot and I had been known to get to shows rather rapidly. Um, but during that period of time, it was really hard, and uh, the planning department had a change in leadership there in the city. It was a typical political thing, and 
I saw it as an opportunity to quit and go full time and at that point I stopped and went into full time and continued doing my pen and ink drawings. I started doing a, a an Escher influence type work because MC Escher was introduced to the United States about that time and it was very similar to some things I had done using positive and negative use of space. And I think it was about mid 1970s, probably about 76, I had an oil man approach me, wanted me to do an oil well picture. And I went, I don't want to do a dirty old oil well. He said, come on. And, and he kept on me and I said, okay, I'll do it. If I can do it the way I want to. I said, I promise you it'll be quality but you have to promise to buy it no matter what I do. And he went, okay. Well, Oklahoma Crude uh, movie had just been screened there in Oklahoma City that year. And I remembered there was an old cable tool rig with a Model T hooked up powering the rig. Well, I thought, well, I want to I want to show it as a dry hole, just like in the movie where he didn't hit oil at first. And I said, well, how do you do that? So I went to the library and went to the geological section and found that the, there were seven basic geological formations. And a simple first one was a simple anodome. It was just a little bump in the earth, a salt dome or something, push it up where the oil collected at the top. So I did the drawing of this oil, of uh, this drilling, drilling down, but I, mit, I made it miss the oil. And he loved it. And the other oil men loved it. And I, and they kept getting me to do things. And I, the the more sarcastic. So you had commissions, your first commission. Oh, yeah. And the more sarcastic I got, the more they loved it. The best selling piece I ever did, I did 350 prints of it. It was a triptych. And it sold out in three months. It was called The Good, The Bad, and The Greedy. It showed a good well, showed a guy missing the oil, and the third guy drilling over and stealing the oil from the first guy. And but that went on for quite a few years, and then um, 1980, probably 86, I got into a situation where I was not getting into the shows uh, that I've been doing for years, and there were some political things that were causing it, and I thought, well, I'm going to just go back to my heritage and start doing Native American work. Uh, I run into uh, Jean Bales at Lawton uh, Arts for All that year, and she was telling me about the uh, uh, Denver, uh, Colorado Indian Market. And that was the first Indian show I got into in 1988. Went up there and had a really good show. How and many pieces did you take? Oh, gosh. I probably had probably no more than 12 or 15 pieces. Originals? Uh, Print. I had a, a few original, but mostly prints. I, mm -hmm. I got into prints at an early age because I found out it was with my technical background. I knew how to get. I had the commercial con connections mm -hmm. for printing and everything, and uh, I've actually gotten doing my own black and white prints. Uh, I was actually doing a, an aluminum etching back in the mm -hmm. '70s and things. So, as as the years went by. I'd say most of my booth was prints with just a few originals. So you had a, a good show there and that sort of determined your covering native subject matter right. from uh, now on out. It was kind of a struggle at first because not growing up around my own culture and you know exposed to the Kiowa and the Comanche as well as the Cherokee it was it was kind of a mixed bag there for a while I you did even, some plains imagery oh yeah I, a lot of my work was influenced by so many of the, of the artists uh, I particularly liked the Kiowa Comanche flat style and, and that really the reason I liked it it was a technically controlled media and being colorblind, if I'm going to work in color, I have to be able to control where that color goes through. Because by using the flat colors, it's it was easy for my mind to relate to the colors. Um, during that same period of time, I decided to kind of deviate a little bit from the traditional flat style. I wanted to introduce a full color sky in the background of a flat style painting. Um, 
unfortunately, I, when I look at a sunset, I couldn't tell what the colors were. So I had to get my wife and my friends to tell me the colors in the sky. And I trained them to start at the horizon and go up at 10% intervals and tell me the colors that they see. And of course, that really started by accident. It was a comment my wife made one evening. We were driving out west. She said, isn't that a beautiful uh, pink sunset? And I said, it can't be. She said, what do you mean it can't be? I said, what color is the sky? She said, blue. I said, what color is the sun? She said, yellow. I said, any first year art student knows that yellow and blue is green. That's a beautiful green sunset. And that's really what got me interested in doing the, the skies. And I think it's worked quite well for me. And you would find the paints with those colors. That right. They had and we, we started out really simple. I, I, we actually went to a poster store there in Oklahoma City. And I picked out six or seven different posters that had contemporary colors that people were southwestern type colors that was real popular at the time. She helped pick, we narrowed it down to, to, to basically five basic colors in black and white and those colors I still basically most of my paintings are built around those primary uh, design colors that I use. It's, it's a very technical way to approach art but it's the only way I can handle color. Mm -hmm. It's a neat a neat technique there. What's one award that you won in a Native Art Show early on that was important to you? Oh gosh, there's so many that's been important to me. Um, I think the one that's most important to me is I hadn't gotten yet. It's uh, <laughs> the Indian Arts and Crafts Association, the National Organization of Artists, and I have been a runner-up eight times since 1988 and it frustrates me that I can't win Indian Artist of the Year and I think that's probably the most important one is the fact that I haven't got it yet. I'm still trying. <laughs> what, who were some of the Native artists that you admired or that you sort of got to know as you started doing shows? The early stages when I first started doing it um, Rance Hood influenced some of my work, as well as uh, Barthel Little Chief. Um, and then, of course, um, uh, I hate it when I have a mind blank like that. Some of our Cherokee traditional. We can uh, Bill Rabbit, I guess. Well, you know actually, what? I didn't know Bill. Okay. Or uh, Dahlia, either one. Uh, I'm that. talking about more uh, the earlier ones that were working more in the flat style. Cecil uh, Dick, maybe. Or? Right, and, and their work influenced me. Of course, uh, Donald and I, uh, his skies are. We have a lot of the same colors and stuff in our skies, and I think his work has always interested me because of the sky techniques that it uh, did, um, but. It took me a while to, to find my own little niche because of the influence of everybody and trying to develop your own technique and it's it's worked quite well for me. Did you ever run into prejudice, sort of? <laughs> well, it's kind of funny that brought that up is that of course, you can tell by my complexion, I, I look more white than I do Indian. Um, so I've never had, growing up, I never had any um, prejudice. Uh, even staying there in Locust Grove, I didn't realize that there was prejudice against Indians, even at an early age. I mean, my nickname was Snowball, but, you know, <laughs> I, I didn't ever think that, I always thought that was, a, you know, uh, the Indian kids weren't being prejudiced in that aspect. It was just something that we, we all had nicknames back then. And I had white hair, and pale skin. Why not be Snowball? That was a good nickname. It wasn't until I was an a adult that I was out west and saw the prejudice against um, and the racism against uh, the Pueblo people and the Navajo people in that region. And when I st was doing art shows and I started doing first doing in my Indian artwork, well, I was traveling a lot. I was doing some mall shows and we were traveling up in Montana and Wyoming. And that was the first time that I actually ever had prejudice of being an Indian that was directly against me that I actually felt it. I was in Great Falls, Montana, and I'd walked away from a booth. 
and a friend of mine was there, was watching the movies. And I come back, and he was talking to this couple there, obviously a well-to-do rancher from the area. And I'm, I, so I didn't want to interrupt the conversation because I thought, well, we might get a sale here, you know. And I heard the conversation, and the, the guy said, well, is he Indian? My friend said, well, yeah, but you're darker than he is. And the guy says, it doesn't matter. I won't buy from a damn Indian. And he turned around and walked off. And I went, oh, my God. And that was the first time that I actually felt that there was oppression. Sometimes out west I've felt almost a reverse prejudice from the other native people because of our mixed background. But um, one of our Cherokee treasures, uh, Potter Mitchell, I, what was her part? I can't Anna. remember. Anna Mitchell. She said something that I got a kick out of one time. We were at a meeting and somebody had brought up the fact that the Plains Indians were making fun of us, the fact that we've been intermarrying. And she says, she got up and she says, I know these people. I show with them. Do you know what? They're marrying white people too. In a hundred years, we can laugh at them. And I loved it. I thought that was the greatest comment on prejudice or race, reverse racism that I've ever heard. What um, changes did you notice in the art scene from the, well, I guess starting the 80s to the 90s? Uh, I really lucked out. I came into the Indian Arts and Crafts business at a very fortunate time. It was 1988 when I first really started doing full-time as a native artist. There in the 90s we had Dances with Wolves come out. They were filming Last of Mohegans and everybody was trying to trace their native roots whether they were or not. And it was it was it was like a boom time. So that was a great period of time. And of course 9/11 actually stop that boom. It, it was just like, it's, and we haven't recovered from it yet. Native American artwork is still just, we're struggling. Uh, I see the jewelers seem to be doing a little bit better, which is always a good sign because they always recover a little. I, my observation is they always recover faster than the two-dimensional work. And if we can get the women starting wearing Indian jewelry again, they'll start buying Indian artwork again to go with their jewelry. <laughs> Sometimes the business part of art is the trickiest to figure out, and it kind of seems like you did that with the non-native subject matter, but how did you deal with the business side of doing native art? Fortunately, uh, the business end of it really wasn't that much different. Uh, it, that is probably one of the hardest things for an artist to do. It's alien to us for us to, to do it. I mean, it, that's completely opposite from the creative end of it. And I've been told that I do it quite well. Um, I've learned at an early period in my art career that galleries, dealers, all of this is an important part of our system. And I've always tried to have a good association with my art galleries, with wholesalers and dealers and wholesale markets. and I actually even opened a little art gallery in Oklahoma City for about a year, which gave me, I never made any money at it, but it gave me an insight into the problems that the gallery owners have. And a lot of the artists don't, can't comprehend why we have to pay the gallery owners so much money. Their overhead makes ours look puny. I mean, their advertising cost alone sometimes equals our show budget. Uh, and a lot of times they really aren't making that much off of us. And I, re I agree that it seems that way. But you also have to design your artwork so you can, you can wholesale. There's a lot of artists out there that are wholesaling to the public and they can't wholesale to the gallery because they don't understand the cost of materials and the cost of goods that when you design a product, you have to have it so you can wholesale it and still make a profit. If you can't, then you've got to find another product. Uh, 
I've been fortunate that I'm a very versatile person. I can change quickly. Uh, I've changed styles numerous times over the years. Uh, I've done sculpture work. I've done paintings. I do pen and ink drawings. Um, I feel very fortunate that I can do this. I have to be careful and not do too much of it. The public has a hard time accepting that we can do more than one thing. You've done some really creative, I think, um, presentations also of prints. I'm thinking that I remember seeing the mat work and things that were. Do you cut your own mats? I and do, do right. I do that? all my own my matting and framing. Um, when the computer print uh, mat cuts first started coming out, that really challenged me. And. I felt that I could hand cut a map, not near as quick, but just as creative. And I came up with some very interesting pieces. I, but I caught myself going, wait a minute, I'm spending as much more time on these silly mats as I did the original. There's got to be a point of stopping. And, but it was fun to do those for a while. Uh, the latest thing that I've been doing with my framing is a technique that I came up with about a year ago in my pen and ink drawings, I'm actually introducing a dimensional element in the frame pieces. I actually do the pen and ink drawing or an ink and watercolor piece. Then I cut a map. Then I put a piece of glass over that map and do another drawing and then put another map over that and then frame it with another glass over it. And what happens is that outer glass reflects all your reflections away and the inner glass disappears so all you have is this three dimension on uh, this drawing floating above the existing drawing and, and I think we're going to get to look at one of those well, here in a minute and it's uh, it's a challenging technique it's uh, but I get bored easy and I, I love to challenge <laughs> myself um, in 1990 the Indian Arts and Crafts Act was passed requiring artists to have proof of enrollment or a letter from their tribe certifying that they could represent that tribe as an artist. Do you remember how that impacted galleries and individuals? Well, that act actually was just a re uh, uh, redetermination of an earlier act passed in the 1930s. Um, it did impact some people who did not or could not prove their heritage. Um, that's unfortunate, but laws generally, as we know in this country, are made for the majority of the, of the people. And I was fortunate that my family had always maintained our tribal uh, ties and that it was quite easy for me to prove that of my heritage. Um, I've had a lot of discussions with other people uh, that unfortunately couldn't prove their heritage. And what they couldn't, or at least the way I perceived it, is they could not, that it's a political thing, not a race thing. Um, when I'm a citizen of the, United, of the Cherokee Nation, that means just like someone would be a citizen of France or a citizen of Germany, it doesn't mean that they're not German or French or English anymore. It just means that they're not a citizen. And because of the fraudulent practices that were coming in from out of the country, these laws and stuff had to be strengthened in order to protect our, our native um, history and culture or, or, the, or they would not exist anymore. And, but any good artist, and I, I firmly believe this, if they want to be an artist, they don't have to be, you know, even if I couldn't prove I was Native American, I'd still be able to do an art. I still could do Native American artwork, I just couldn't claim it was done by a Native American. I probably would have changed my subject and gone into something contemporary or something else, but I think a good a creative artist that shouldn't limit them. 
what's been one of the best comments or responses you've gotten when you've been showing your art? Oh, gosh. I think generally when they find out that I'm red, green, colorblind. That's, uh, it, it's difficult for them to comprehend how how I perceive things and how it actually comes about. And I always think that, and then anytime anybody identifies the Oriental influence of my work, I always love that. I mean, that is probably the best compliment you can give me is that, gee, that kind of reminds me of Oriental work. <laughs> because of that early influence. That stylization and the... Right. Mm -hmm. I think one new vein you've been exploring recently is what you call contemporary ledger art, where you're using old, you know, pages from the Cherokee Phoenix or old Cherokee maps and then doing uh, figures on them. Can you t talk about how you got that idea? Well, that idea actually started on my way back from a show back east. Me and John Guthrie were coming back uh, to Oklahoma together and we were sitting there talking about just feeding ideas off and back and off of each other. And we were trying to think of a new way to do the Trail of Tears, a different way that hadn't been done. That specific category you're talking about right. at the Trail of Tears and, Art Show. Um, I came up and I, we were talking about Jackson who was responsible for the Trail of Tears and the $20 bill, the fact that Jackson's picture was on it. And I went, I came up with the idea of incorporating the Trail of Tears on a $20 bill. I enlarged the $20 bill up, which is legal, as long as it's not, you know, and I had, a, and then I did a painting of the Trail of Tears at the bottom of it. And it was called Jackson's Legacy. And that was the first contemporary ledger piece that I did, because it wasn't done in that traditional plain style of ledger, but still it was done on a document. And it was been so well received. As a matter of fact, it was bought by the uh, Indian Museum in Wichita, Kansas, part of their permanent collection. The original actually has the $20 bill in it. And that was an interesting story in itself because I wanted a $20 bill to tie into the Trail of Tears. So I went to coin shop after coin shop trying to find a $20 bill that was printed back in 1835. And our something from Tahlequah or something from Chattanooga or something. And finally this one corn dealer says, well, if you found something like that, it would be extremely rare and very, very expensive. And I was really dissing her. I mean, I'm just, I was going, I'm just not going to find a 20 that I want. And I was walking out of the store and this $20 bill, you've heard of that where something will reach out and grab you. Mm -hmm. Something grabbed my attention and I turned around and walked back into the store and I looked at this 20 and I went, oh my God. It was issued in Atlanta, Georgia in 1935. 1835 or 1935? 1935. That okay. was the 100th anniversary of the first law the state of Georgia passed against the Cherokees that mm -hmm. led to the Trail of Tears. Here was, and it, later I found out it was the first year that Jackson had been put on a 20. All of that came to, that was my 20. And that's what really started. And so I started looking at these other documents, trying to see how I can do it. And of course, going back to that little satirical humor that I developed back in the, the oil boom days, I naturally had to start injecting that into it. And of course, the Declaration of Independence. Wow, here's another one for the Trail of Tears. The Constitution. Influenced by Native people. Franklin and Jefferson both said it was influenced by Native. There's another one. And there's document after document I keep finding. I'm going, wow, I, how can I, you know, incorporate this? And, of course, about a year ago, the Cherokee Nation uh, commissioned uh, several artists to, to do guitars, painted guitars. Well, there was no way to transfer a document to that guitar that I, I tried. I tried decoupaging the decoration on it and it just didn't work. So I ended up hand painting a copy of a Revolutionary War map on there with the two Cherokees on it and the map. And that's kind of, 
the first time that I actually had to do my own document. And now I'm there's several of them is, uh, that I've done recently that I've actually had to do my own document. Mm -hmm. Now, was this a, a casino commission? Or uh, this was, was it? For, yeah, it was for the Hard Rock right. uh, uh, Casino there, and it's in the permanent, that guitar is in the permanent collection there in the, uh, uh, not the cafeteria, the other word for It's one of the restaurants. <laughs> right, uh, I'm going to have to look for that. <laughs> Um, you publish an online newsletter, I noticed, which involves writing as well as, you know, design work and layout. Mm -hmm. um, how did you get the idea to do a newsletter? I've been, I've tried several different communication ways with the, the digital age. Uh, I had to learn to use the computer to do my own printing. and. I didn't like Facebook or any of those social medias. It's just because one reason I just really don't have time to deal with the pettiness of a lot of that. But I wanted a way of communicating to my customers and to the other people around me what I was doing, what was going on. Now, previously in the 70s and 80s, I'd put out brochures or updated little flyers that I'd sent out occasionally. Basically, it was basically a, a hard copy newsletter. Well, I came up with the idea of doing a, a digital news. Ideally, I'd love to do it every month. Unfortunately, it's like this last time, it was three months before I got around to doing it, but I had six paintings I had to get out for the Cherokee Nation. I got six commissions for paintings for their uh, Veterans Center, and I just got those finished up, and that was the sub main subject matter of this last newsletter. <laughs> Well, congratulations on Thank that. You. Uh, you won first place in 2012 at the in the Trail of Tears category, I guess, at the um, Cherokee Museum Art Show. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, and you won a lot of awards. Does that change the feeling when you win, or? When I first started out in the 70s, awards were very important to me as a young artist. I mean, it was a Oh, I mean, that was a heck of an ego booster. Sometime during those years, it got, making money was more important to me because it was the only source of income our family had, and the awards really took a back seat. It wasn't until just recently, um, actually after I moved back uh, over here into the Cherokee Nation, uh, I had a lot of life-changing situations that happened. I, that I got interested. I well, I had a heart attack last year, and mm -hmm. it really kind of a wake-up call. Uh, I had a triple by ended up with triple bypass, and I really cut back on my show schedule a lot. And it's not that important for me to be making money anymore. I mean, we all need to make money, but it's I make. A, I'm comfortable with my income that I have in now, and so making money at the shows isn't as important. So I find myself again, full circle back to the beginning again, excited about the competitions. And now the pieces are more inspired by trying to come up with something unique to compete with rather than come up with something that will sell. <laughs> That's neat. Well, let's talk about your process and techniques a little bit more. Um, or do you work with in terms of your originals when they're not pen and inks, when they're paintings? Are they primarily gouache or a mixture of gouache and ink, or, or are they acrylic paintings? I work in, both, in all three medias. Uh, I do pen and inks. I do a mixed media of ink and watercolor. I do gouache and I do acrylics. The gouache and the watercolors and the acrylics are done in using that flat style, but I also use a lot of airbrush techniques in my work. Um, you'll see a lot of hard edge work in it that resembles stencil work. That's actually one of a kind stencil done for that airbrush that I actually do right on top of the painting. I actually hand cut it out with an X-Acto mm -hmm. knife and then so it's unique one of a kind 
stencil work using the airbrush. I started using the airbrush when I started doing my skies to get the, the cloud effects and everything. Right. And you mentioned that you've tried your hand at sculpture. Yeah, I got into, I've always loved three-dimensional work. Um, even back in the early days, uh, I played with some polymer clay sculptures back in the 70s, just some little miniatures. And it was more just, was an exercise uh, to, to relax my mind from the, the two-dimensional, because a lot of my work is so technical and it, it really becomes intricate uh, mentally uh, consuming and working with the sculpture kind of relaxes me and it gives me another direction to go with the with this creative work. Um, when I was living in Prague a friend of mine was a welder he broke his leg and couldn't do shows anymore I mean couldn't work full time anymore and he'd done a few little craft shows with just some little basic cut out steel stuff and, and I approached Harold, and uh, he's a seminal, and I approached him, I said, Harold, I've got these three-dimensional ideas. I'll work with you with this. You do the metal work, I'll give you the ideas, I'll show you, we'll, and we worked side by side there for a while. And he was using a plasma touch to, torch to cut the pieces out and everything, and one day I designed this piece, it was, he just couldn't grasp. It was a positive negative space and he couldn't grasp negative space. And he was messing it up. And I said, give me that torch. I said, it looks like a big clumsy airbrush. I can do that. And he kind of warned me a little bit, but he stepped back and I started cutting out. And he looked at me and he says, I've never seen anybody just pick up a torch and start cutting like that. And I said, well, it's just like this big clumsy airbrush, <laughs> except I got to remember not to put my hand there to shade to block some of the, the torch out with. And that's really how I got into doing the metal work. And of course, I worked with Harold for quite a few years. Are and these the source of some of the lamps? That the lamps and then some of the uh, three uh, war shields that we did. Mm -hmm. And then I actually did uh, some, the last pieces I did were actually, I did a wood base um, because to, uh, like a pedestal and built the sculpture on it. So it was a freestanding metal work. And the reason that was done is when you come enter into the competition, if you enter a wall piece that's metal, they lay it on a table because they don't have hanging space for the metal. And it just doesn't show the work mm -hmm. off. So I came up with this idea of, well, I'll just build my own wall. Right. <laughs> I tried easels at first, but they wouldn't, you know, that was clumsy. And so it, but when I downsized and everything, I had to give up my metal work. But I do have plans to start picking up doing the polymer clay sculptures again. It's, like I said, it's a nice diversion from doing all that real technical type work. How important is preliminary sketching to your work? Oh, gosh, that's the basis. Drawing is the basis to all art. I go through tons of tracing paper. I do it, I approach it much like a commercial artist does. I'll do a rough layout. I'll let, overlay it, clean it up, I'll overlay that overlay, I'll keep making overlays of previous overlays until I come up with a final layout. And Because my work is so technical, you've got to know where everything is going to go before you start. You can't just randomly approach a piece and let the color dominate your direction and everything, and composition, you've got to plan it all out. Now I realize some artists work quite well the other way, I don't. <laughs> what kinds of research do you do for your paintings? Historical research is very important to me. Um, I try not to make historical mistakes. I've made a few over the years and it's made me more observant on these things. I mean, it's, as a matter of fact, Alan Hauser, well-known world now sculptor, actually pointed out a mistake to me in, uh, I think it was 89, I believe, I was doing a show in Albuquerque, 
and I didn't recognize him. He walked up to my booth. I was set up in front of Scheffler's there in, um, in Albuquerque, New Mexico. And he's a little short. And the Indian comes up to me and starts talking to me. We're talking for quite a while. And he pointed out a little mistake I made. And I said, oh, do you do artwork? And he says, oh, I dabble in it. And as he walked away, all of a sudden I realized who it was. Too late. It was Alan Hauser of all people. Do you do any artwork? Oh, I dabble in it. <laughs> but that was great. But, you know, in a way that was kind of embarrassing, too, the fact that... But he, he was so nice about it. I mean, he could have really made an issue about it. And uh, so it's important to me. I, I have a small library of research books that I've purchased over the years. Um, of course now I use the computer to go online sometimes when I run into my daughter keeps reminding me I when I come up with some idea or something she says, well go online. And I'm like, oh yeah, forget about that. I still think you have to go to the library, you have to go to a book. You, you know. It was like recently one of the questions that, a technical question that's been bothering me for a long time. I've inquired several times trying to find the origin of why the Cherokees started wearing turbans. Yeah, this question that I was asking is where are the turbans originated from? I've got some theories, but I have not substantiated those theories. Uh, they started wearing them there in the late 1700s, early 1800s. That was after the Cherokees had been taken to England and introduced to into the court as royalty and at that time England was a world power and they would have had representatives from around the world including people from India and Africa who would have worn turbans or because we were slave owners some of the African slaves that we would have owned would have worn turbans those are two possibilities that would have influenced it I would like to think it was the, were the English court but I have not found any documentation to prove otherwise. My daughter said, well, go online and find out, which I haven't done yet, but I, I will. <laughs> you know, little things like that is, it's a curiosity of why sometimes. <laughs> right. You've kind of touched on why veterans themes are important to you too, but I wonder if there's any more to say on that. Yes, this was a good opportunity that came up recently when the Cherokee Nation opened a competition uh, to get commissions for the uh, vet new Veterans Center. Uh, I'm a U.S. Air Force veteran. I was in there in 62 to, uh, 63 to 65. Uh, my dad was a World War II veteran. He, was, uh, he had actually gone into the Army in 1938. And he was in the Battle of the uh, Dutch Harbor, which was when Japan attacked Wake, uh, Wake Island, the Battle of Midway there. Not Wake Island, it was Battle of Midway. They actually had a diversionary attack. And Dad's company, they had one company up there at Dutch Harbor, and that was the only thing between Japan and the United States. And the stories he's, he's told me about that. Um, Matter of fact, I've been working on a project for the last couple of years. Hopefully, I'll get to work on it again this year. Is uh, the story of my dad at Dutch Harbor is a graphic novel I'm working on. And, uh, hopefully, when he gets completed, I'll present it over there to our veteran center. Maybe we'll they'll include a copy of the book in there. That would be neat. You've mentioned humor in your work. Um, and a lot of times I'll find humor in some of your titles. How do, how do you come up with your title? <laughs> titles are probably the most interesting things to come up with. Generally the titles are after the paintings. I know a lot of people come up with the subject matter and the titles at first, but mine usually come at the end. Um, one of my most popular sources of titles are movies. During the oil boom days I used a lot of Clint Eastwood titles. High Plains Drifter, Driller, <laughs> Drifter became the High Plains Drifter. The good and bad and the ugly came the good, the bad and the greedy. A few dollars more, a fistful of dollars. And uh, today I use a lot of uh, music. I'll go through 
record albums and going through their names and stuff just to, because when you've been doing shows and artwork as long as I have, you, you hate to keep using the same title. I mean, and as a Cherokee, we are guilty of doing a lot of Trail of Tears pieces. I, I, I fully admit that, or at least I am. But how many of them can you keep calling Trail of Tears? So, so it's always trying to, okay, now how can I call this a Trail of Tears but not call it the, with a new twist on the same name? And so it's always a challenge like that. And But music, I, I'll go through those music titles and a lot of times I'll come up with, oh, well, that's a good title. <laughs> now how can I tie this into my painting? <laughs> You have a really elaborate signature, actually, because it's the Oklahoma flag, as I understand it, the logo. But you add your initials or your full name to yeah. it. That grew over the years. Uh, my family name is Foreman. And I, when I first started doing shows, I did four little horsemen, four men. Well, on my mother's side is Rainwater, which is a, another Cherokee family out of the, but, but our side of the Rainwaters quit being Cherokee in the 1900s because they stayed in Georgia too long. Uh, not by choice, but, you know. But, so I had this little rain cloud above these four horsemen, Rainwater, and I kept elaborating on it, and I thought, well, and it is influenced a lot by the, the, the Oklahoma, uh, flag seal, it does resemble that quite a lot, because the circle around it represents the circle or unity of the family or tribe, so I stuck the four horsemen inside this circle representing the tribe. Well, the shield itself is a seven-sided shield, representing the seven-sided council house of the Cherokee Nation. So now I have the four men, the family and a tribe, and the council house. But my work is influenced by the Plains flat style. So I put a flat style, a Plains flute on it. And I hang seven feathers representing the seven clans of the Cherokee Nation. But that developed over about five years. <laughs> and it's a mini painting. Yes. In itself, yeah. What is your creative process from the time you get an idea? The ideal development takes considerably longer than the painting. Uh, I'm a rather fast painter or draw, illustrator because that's basically a lot of my work is in illustrations. But it's the idea and putting it into a dimensional, a two-dimensional form. That's the most time-consuming thing. And a lot of times it just starts with a an abstract thought or, or concept, or sometimes it's just just out of the blue, like the twenty-dollar bill inspiring mm -hmm. that one piece. It, it, uh, and a lot, of, uh, like a lot of creative people, the solutions to these concepts happens early morning. There's been numerous times that I've solved my problem in my sleep. I wake up at three or four in the morning and. The idea is there. I have to get up and write down this, this how I solved that particular problem. Uh, and sometimes it's just a smart remark another person made. Uh, a few years ago, I was working on a piece. I was a transitional piece. I wanted to show an eagle dancer changing to an eagle, and I was that transitional phase where the two images overlap each other is probably the most difficult part of, of that type of work. And I was having a real difficult time problem of solving it. And an artist friend of mine, she just said, well, why don't you just put the rear end of the eagle on his face? And she was just being facetious and, you know, trying to be a little smart aleck and she walked away and I looked at it and by God it solved the problem. <laughs> if you see the final painting you'll see that it basically his head is where the eagle's butt is. <laughs> What's your creative routine? Do you paint more during the day, at night? 
I trained myself to be more of a daytime painter. I know when I first started, it was more of an evening. I seemed to work best from like from one or two in the afternoon to midnight. Now my most productive time is if I can get started in the morning. If I can't get started, it's hard for me to start any time during the day. Now once I get started, I can work 10, 12, 14 hours. But maybe this has to do with age too. I, I wake up earlier now than I used to and go to bed earlier. So it's a good thing I can paint earlier in the morning now. Looking back on your career so far, what was a fork in the road moment for you where you might have gone one way but you went another? Probably the Air Force. If they'd put me into something that would have utilized my artistic abilities instead of sticking me in the Air Police, I probably would have made a career out of it. But fortunately, they stuck me in that, which in, which caused me to take that other road that eventually led down to technical illustration to that job in Oklahoma City that led to the Oklahoma City Arts Festival that mm -hmm. led to this. What's been one of the low points of your career? <sighs> well, being in it for 42 years, is those recessions every time we've I've gone through several recessions and of course the, the last one is the most devastating uh, so it was probably the most devastating it, because not only did financially I lose a lot my wife passed away I had a heart attack so it, it, it's it was a combination of a lot of negative things of course the positive thing is is, is now I'm living back in the Cherokee Nation doing what I love to do and I'm not under any pressures of financial pressures to that I have to get out there and sell something you know. so those negatives do you know but it makes a stronger person out of you I believe how about a high point oh the high points gosh I guess the one of the first ones was my first $1,000 show. And in 1973, the Kansas City Plaza show, I did a little over $1,100. And in 1973, that's a lot of money. And I remember my wife and I were got back to the motel. We were pulling, of course, back then, the most expensive piece I had in the booth was $150. So we were selling a lot of $10 and $20 items. I mean, we had a bed pile of 20, 10s and 20s on this bed. It looked like we were rich. And of course, we felt like we were rich. <laughs> and of course, how easy that $1,000 now would, wouldn't amount to a hill of beans, but that was, that was probably one of the most wonderful feelings. And recognition, uh, you know, by your peers, by the, by the public, that's always just, is so good. I mean, it's, we got to have our ego stroked once in a while, and those awards, and, and of course the ultimate compliment I've always said is when you buy a piece of artwork from me, mm -hmm. is that you take your hard earned money and you're actually doing something that I've sat there and painted, and it, 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 sometimes it amazes me that people will do that. Because I'll go home and paint it. I won't paint somebody. But I, won't. I shouldn't say that. I paid, I've bought other artwork over the years mm -hmm. when they wouldn't trade. <laughs> well, is there anything else you'd like to talk about before we look at a couple of examples of your work? Anything we forgot to mention? Oh, gosh. So much happened over the last 42 years. It would hard, be hard for me to try to single out any one item during that period of time. I think we've hit on the highlights of it. That's all I think we could hope to do. <laughs> Otherwise, we'd have to get a lot longer film. It'd, it'd make a mo mo motion picture out of it. Well, okay, we're going to pause here a moment and uh, get your work set up. Okay, this is a new piece I'm working on. It's a gouache on illustration board. 
using a combination of airbrush and dry brush techniques. Uh, this is a replica of the piece I did for the uh, guitar for the uh, Hard Rock Casino. Of course, I had, you know, the whole composition had to change because it's no longer fitting on a guitar. And what I'm showing is that a, a period of time in Cherokee history when the Cherokee actually fought for the British during the Revolutionary War. We were told that we would keep our lands and the white man would never come across the Appalachian Mountains. So, and so we immediately took up arms against the uh, colonists, uh, the United States of America, or the future United States. We fought against the, the for about six months and we ended up when we signed our peace treaty, that was the first time we lost part of our land. We ended up losing over five million acres because we fought six months. We were always picking the wrong side to fight on. <laughs> so what would you like to share with us about your sculpture here? This is a polymer clay sculpture that's a, a low fire clay. This was done a few years ago. This is media that I'm going to start working in again. This is about nine inches tall. And it's a Tashi. He was uh, also known as Dutch. He came with his parents to Indian Territory after the War of 1812 and became a basically an Indian fighter and guide. He fought the Kiowas, the Comanches, he became a really skilled fighter and later led uh, different military expeditions all over Oklahoma. And he became one of our Cherokee leaders after the Trail of Tears, too, because he actually worked with the news people when they came. And that's one of the first pieces I did, did with this much detail in it. Yeah, it's got wonderful detail. And how about this piece? Okay, this is a, a gouache painting of Osceola, famous uh, Seminole War chief, uh, fought during the Seminole Wars and resisted the Trail of Tears. And it was the beginning, I'd set out to do a series of warriors from each one of the five civilized tribes. Unfortunately, I've never got around to the other four yet. But that gives me something to do in the future. This is using airbrush and dry brush techniques. You can see the background is using that airbrush technique where I kind of use the trees in a very simple form, a, a block printing type element and then use the dry brush technique and the flat style in the figure where I do all the detail work. Right, that's really nice. And he's real famous for that supposedly stabbing a <clears throat> knife into the treaty right. in rejection, but I wanted this knife to be a three-dimensional effect instead of actually going where he's shoving it right in your face and set it down on the table like it, like it would really historically happen. I, I took a few liberties with history here on this one. Right. <laughs> well, when I first started doing art shows, the public intimidated me a little bit, I suppose, or maybe I was just a little bit on the bashful side. And I decided it, I don't know that it was a conscious decision, but I role played. I started assuming a figure, highly influenced by the High Plains Drifter, uh, which the Clint Eastwood movie had just recently or was out. The black hat, the long black, and I had a black duster custom made for one of the shows that I'd gone to, and so I started wearing all black, and I had dark tinted glasses, and these black hat, and I'd walk around with a real stern face because I just didn't really know how to react. Uh, in one example is I was walking through this, one of my early shows in this all black outfit. And three women that knew me real well, they went, Ronnie, smile. And I turned around, I went, damn it, I am smiling. And of course I had to get around the corner real quick because I cracked up laughing. <laughs> and the reaction I got from them was great. So I just, I. I just kept creating this character until one day I woke up and I realized, wait a minute, I am him. I, well, I, I wasn't creating somebody, I was letting him out of the box. <laughs> so this character that I thought I was creating was real me, that it was just 
So now today, I no longer have to use those props like the cowboy hat, the dark glasses, the dark black. Of course, I've still got dark clothes on, but you know, it, and I'm comfortable relating to people. But it's those early days that that really helped me a lot to be able to communicate. And of course, once I figured out, is wait a minute, they're on my turf. It's I'm in control here, not them. Then I, you know, it was a lot easier for me to talk with the public. Thank you for your time today. Well, you're welcome. <laughs>